All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so as uh, James very kindly uh, introduced me, I am the director of formulations at Avanti Polar Lipids. And I'm sure that most of you have had um, a lot of experience with Avanti. You know, you think of us mostly as a company from, what, from who you can purchase uh, research phospholipids. Or if you've had um, any kind of exposure to GMP manufacturing, we also provide phospholipids for your GMP manufacturing needs. However, most people don't quite think of us in terms of a company that is able to provide you with formulation services as well as uh, analytical services. And today I wanted to bring up some of those, um, some of those aspects of our company. That's the clicker. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So um, when most of us think about a drug formulation and uh, drug development, we think in terms of starting out from bench scale experiments, as in this case where you have these very beautiful docs um, liposomes, beautifully encapsulated. You test them, they work, you go on to your clinical trial, you do your um, safety and efficacy studies, and you go on through phase three and get this beautiful commercial product where you then make millions and millions of dollars and everything is fine and dandy, and you save the world as well. However, in most cases, this is what typically happens during the clinical trial phase. Um, a giant black hole is lurking in the clinical trial process. It eats up all of your time. It eats up all of the um, great experiments and great results that you've done, and your drug disappears into the abyss. So um, one thing that we've learned while doing formulation services for a lot of our customers is that um, considering some of these liposomal-specific formulation properties can actually help your liposome um, avoid that event horizon. Of course, you know, there are inherent um, issues with drug development, and we know that only a very small percentage of drugs survive the clinical trial process. But I hope that the in information I can give you today might help you um, a little bit, at least in terms of the liposomal side of that. So what are some of these formulations considerations? Um, the first thing, and a very basic thing, is the phase transition temperature of your um, membrane. So the phase transition temperature is defined as the temperature where the um, phospholipid bilayer will transition from either a liquid crystalline phase to a gel phase or vice versa. Um, the liquid crystalline phase is defined as when the uh, fatty acid tails of the phospholipids are in their more fluid and dynamic phase, whereas in the gel phase, those phospholipid tails are um, more tightly packed and um, fully extended. And actually determine, determining that phase transition temperature in a formulation is crucial for downstream processes where you're sizing the particles. So whenever you do extrusion, emulsion, sonication, filtration, um, that phase transition temperature and working above that phase transition temperature is very important. Um, in a mixed lipid system, you should always be thinking about working above the transition temperature of the highest um, TM species. Actually, you'd be really surprised how many people come to us with questions like, oh, hey, we're working with 18 OPC. Um, we are extruding it, and for some reason, it's just not going through the membrane. Why is it not going through the membrane? First question we, we always ask is, are you working at room temperature, or are you working above 60 degrees Celsius? And they go, why would you work above 60 degrees Celsius? Well, because the transition temperature of DSPC is 55 degrees Celsius. Um, the caveat to that, though, is that, um, oh, I'm sorry. Another thing I wanted to mention is that um, choosing lipids with similar transition temperatures in a mixed lipid species, um, in a mixed lipid formulation, is really important as well, because if you don't, you can get phase separation. And what phase separation is, is when you have within the same liposome both uh, one species of your lipid at the liquid crystalline phase and another species in the gel phase. And if you can think of that as, you know, you've got these islands of lipids that are behaving one way chemically in another island that's behaving a different way chemically, that doesn't bode well for your liposome. Um, so we typically tell people to try and choose lipids with similar transition temperatures to try and avoid that phase separation. But um, when you're choosing lipids and you have to work at elevated temperatures, that can lead to lysophospholipid formation. Lysophospholipid being when you lose one fatty acid tail, um, one or both, well, one fatty acid tail due to um, hydrolysis. So the phase transition temperature is influenced by both the uh, head group and the fatty acyl chain degree of saturation and the fatty acyl chain length. So um, for example, your DOPC, which is an 18-1 PC, will have a transition temperature of minus 20 degrees. 
if you remove that saturation, if you remove that uh, unsaturation, your transition temperature jumps 75 degrees. Um, if you shorten that chain, you get a transition temperature of 23 degrees. But if you use a similar chain length PE, that transition temperature is actually 50 degrees. So those, those are all things to keep in mind. You can't just say, oh, I'm working with a 14-0 you know, phospholipid, so it must be close to the PC. No, it isn't. If you're working with a PE, that transition temperature can be really high. Um, and um, so the, uh, the other thing that's really important about choosing lipids and um, uh, taking into account their phase transition temperature is that uh, the, the phase of the lipid will influence how leaky the liposomes are. When you're in this liquid crystalline phase and you're imagining these fatty acid tails are in that more fluid state, we tend to think of those liposomes as more, being more leaky towards small molecules. Um, there's a lot more movement in that bilayer, therefore you have um, small molecules that can transfer both in and out of the liposome. Whereas when you're in the gel phase, because of that tighter packing, the liposomes are less leaky. So ideally for an encapsulated drug, we typically try and um, recommend that you pick a set of lipids that are in their gel phase during the storage temperature, for example, at four degrees, and that are in the liquid crystalline phase when they're administered to the patient. Okay, another factor to think about is liposome stability. Um, so liposomes are influenced by the same factors that can affect any type of formulation stability, including pH and storage temperature. However, uh, factors that can more specifically affect liposome stability uh, include phospholip uh, lysophospholipid form formation, which is basically inherent to lipids, phospholipids being present in an aqueous environment, the oxidation of unsaturated fatty acid tails. Now, both of these factors can lead to bilayer leakage. Um, other things that can affect stability include surface charge and uh, buffer species, which both can lead to aggregation or accelerated hydrolysis. Another question that I've been asked is, um, we have uh, liposomes that we're making with DPPG. Um, why can't, you know, and every time we hydrate them, they form these, uh, these huge aggregates. What's going on with our formulation? And I ask, well, what's in your buffer? And they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's uh, PBS with some calcium and some magnesium. And I go, well, yeah, that calcium is going to cross-link your negatively charged phospholipids. Um, so to help preserve the stability of the liposomes, um, there are several different approaches. Lawfulization is a really good approach, but I'm not going to discuss that in detail today. Um, if you have any questions about how to lyophilize your phospholipids, you can come talk to me. Um, and uh, the addition of cholesterol, which we will address today. So um, forming lysophospholipids and oxidized lipids will affect the uh, bilayer structure. Um, an excess percentage of lysophospholipids can actually lead to observable and measurable liposome breakdown. Even very small quantities, uh, five, up to 5% of lysophospholipids, can introduce imperfections in the membrane. So here, for example, is a membrane that has some lysophospholipid, and as you can imagine, this absence of a, a, an additional fatty acid tail to pack in this area can open up channels where your small molecule, encapsulated small molecule, can go both in and out of the membrane. Um, oxidized fatty acid chains can introduce flip-flop in the membrane, opening up, again, channels where you can have um, molecules coming in and out. Liposome stability is affected by charge. Um, so, for example, having a general overall negative surface charge or positive surface charge can actually help um, prevent aggregation of small molecules, but surface charge is actually also very useful for liposomal delivery because cell surfaces typically tend to be negatively charged. Having a slight positive charge on your liposome can help attract them to the cell membrane. And then, as I said, using cholesterol actually can, infect, can affect all of those previous formulations considerations that I had talked about. So in terms of how it affects phase transition, adding a significant amount of cholesterol to uh, a formulation helps broaden the temperature range within which uh, the, the bilayer membrane is in a liquid crystalline phase. 
Um, we found actually that when you work with 18 OPC, sometimes by adding a significant, let's say, 20 to 30 percent of cholesterol in that formulation, you can actually drop the temperature at which you can extrude those uh, liposomes down from 60, to 60 degrees to maybe even 40, 35 degrees, making it a whole lot easier to operate. Um, cholesterol also affects stability. Um, in the bilayer membrane, cholesterol tends to pack close to the phospholipid head. So by having that cholesterol there, um, it, can, it can prevent water molecules from penetrating the lipid bilayer and um, introducing that hydrolysis. Um, also in a membrane, sorry, I'm going to go back again. In a membrane where you have lysophospholipids um, forming and opening up these small channels, the size of the cholesterol allows it to pack into these channels and actually preserve the bilayer integrity. Um, things to think about with cholesterol are that some cholesterol oxidation products are cytotox uh, cardiotoxic, I'm sorry, um, for example, 25-hydroxy cholesterol. So we monitor the levels of 25-hydroxy cholesterol in all of our uh, GMP formulations. And um, what we found that is that it's actually fairly stable in a liposome formulation when that formulation is properly handled. So no excess oxygen, you know, topping off your formulation with nitrogen, some kind of inert gas. Um, and then that brings up also the topic of lipid source, which is whether your lipids are animal source or semi-synthetic. So most of the cholesterols on the market are actually wool grease cholesterol um, from sheep. Avanti produces a semi-synthetic cholesterol, which has been synthesized from a plant sterile. It's a really good product. Um, so going on to that issue of uh, lipid source, we typically tend to discourage the use of natural lipids for pharmaceutical formulations, even at the R&D even at the R&D scale, um, because these are heterogeneous lipid species. So the composition can change from batch to batch. Um, they typically have more stability issues because of the higher percentage of polyunsaturated lipids, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, it's more difficult to fine tune that composition because of that batch to batch difference. So um, sometimes a very small change can influence the kinetics of your drug release. And if you're having batch to batch differences, you can't really, you can't really dial in that, that final ideal composition for your formulation. Um, being that some of these are animal-derived products, you run into issues like BSE and other health concerns. And um, at this point, the cost savings is actually small to none, especially when you're scaling up into commercial production. So here's an example, soy PC. As you can see, the fatty acid distribution, the typical fatty acid distribution is shown below, where you have um, 16-0, 18-0, 18-1, and a whole lot of 18-2 and 18-3 phospholipids. Um, these unsaturated fatty acid chains, if you don't need them for your formulation, should really be excluded because of that issue with oxidation and stability concerns. And the cost of soy PC, as posted on the Avanti website, is about $560 a gram right now, which is the cost that you're used to seeing if you're uh, an academic researcher. Um, so like I said, two of the most prominent species are the 16 and 181 PCs. You can mix those two lipid species together to ma make a mixed lipid formulation. Um, but you might run into issues with phase separation because of that transition temperature difference. Or you can use POPC, which has a 16 chain and an 18 chain. And look at that. POPC is actually cheaper than soy PC. This is a semi-synthetic um, POPC. And when you go to the GMP manufacturing at a multi-kilogram scale, the cost is actually $8 a gram. So think about that. And then um, I also wanted to transition into, have, into some of these analytical considerations for your um, formulation development. Uh, there are a few, fa uh, a few analytics factors that are um, constant with all liposome formulations that uh, the FDA typically asks for for clinical trials. And um, even as an excipient, you typically have to identify your lipid, make sure, confirm its identity, as well as its purity. And we found that the best method to address that is by LCMS. So here's a typical, um, typical uh, graph of what our LCMS uh, analysis will look like. This is a liposome formulation which has 18 OPC with two minor species. And the breakdown products of 18 OPC are stearic acid and lyso 18 OPC. As you can see, we can very well separate all of those species, including both different types of lyso. 
Um, and then the two minor species are shown here below. So that is a very adequate analysis for that kind of, um, for that kind of information. Another point that uh, people typically ask for is free drug substance and percent encapsulation. So here's an example of a liposomal drug to which we um, coupled a, uh, the, uh, the liposome to the free drug. Now the free drug is on the outside surface. In this case, um, it attaches to the liposome. So upon the initial coupling, you can see that the liposomal drug is approximately 72.5%. So 72.5% of the drug is liposomal and uh, about 27.5% of the drug is free. Um, we apply tangential flow filtration uh, to remove the free drug, and as you can see, most of the free drug gets removed after TFF, and you can monitor that. So you can also monitor such a formulation over time using the same type of method. Um, particle size, zeta potential, I don't really need to get into that because ALF has very, uh, very well covered those two points. So I uh, just wanted to tell you that that's another thing that uh, the regulatory bodies will ask for in terms of uh, analyzing the stability of a liposomal formulation. So zeta potential here, we can monitor that over time. And I mean, sorry, that was particle size. Now this is zeta potential. We can also do that at Avanti. So um, to wrap up, um, I think that fo focusing in on some of these key, uh, very fundamental lipid properties during early R&D can help minimize uh, production, scale-up issues, and you know just issues when, that people run into in clinical trials. And uh, choosing the right analytical methods to determine these properties can be very important as well. And here's the shameless plug. Avanti has all of these uh, products and services at your disposal, formulations and analytical. And please think of us the next time you run into these kind of, uh, you're, you're developing a new liposomal formulation. Thank you very much for your time. A uh, very informative talk. Uh, can you comment on your capabilities in terms of production scales for um, liposomes or lipid nanoparticles and any experience with uh, lipid nanoparticles of nucleic acids? Uh, yes, we actually, um, so that free drug that I was showing you for the size exclusion column was actually a nucleic acid formulation. Um, we do have experience working with nucleic acids. We have instruments that are capable of producing uh, batch sizes of up to approximately 200 liters per batch. Um, so we can, we can definitely do scale up at Avanti. Hi, thank you for the lovely talk. So I have a question about uh, other chemical factors influencing the stability of uh, the liposomes. So once in the digestive tract before entering the, let's say, intestine, uh, how is it stable and for how long? Because, you know, it is important for absorption. Absolutely. Thank and you. I, th I think those kinds of things are, um, it, it will differ depending on your formulation. I think that um, there are tests that you can perform such as simulated gastric fluid, so you can perform analytical, analytical experiments uh, ahead of the digestion, analytical experiments after the digestion to see how your drug is incorporated into the liposomes. Um, whether that breakdown of the liposomes will create smaller micelles that still continue to encapsulate your drug and continue to help them deliver that drug product into, uh, into the blood. So, uh, yes, that can be tested for as well. Uh, thank you for your talk. I've <clears throat> purchased many uh, Vonti lipids in the, yes. my past. I have a question. You mentioned that um, for storage, it's good to have your formulation in a gel phase, and for administration, it would be at a liquid crystalline phase. But if you have a lipid, pure lipid formulation, when you, when you, when you transition from gel to liquid crystalline, the liposomes will leak. Right. So um, without cholesterol, for example. Right. So having a statement that says, make the liposomes in gel phase and then administer them in liquid crystalline, you may have some issues if somebody's just looking at that and doesn't have a uh, good experience. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I like, agree with yeah. that. Yes, I think uh, the thought behind that was that, for example, for a parenteral drug application, um, one would, you know, inject the drug and then uh, it would begin immediately to release the content. However, that that is not always the case. So. Um, 
uh, most of the time people are actually trying to target the liposomes to a certain location. So that's when you should really start, be, start thinking of perhaps adding cholesterol to the formulation in order to prevent that immediate le leakage prior to cellular uptake. That is a very good point. Thank you.